Clive and Wrench is a game that I had been looking forward to for a long time. A passion project from a new creator and possibly my favourite genre of video game. And it looked really good as well. But as many of you may have seen when the game launched, the reviews from others were not the most promising. Thanks to this, I couldn't help going into the game with cautious optimism, hence why I'm even mentioning it now. And my takeaway coming out of this game is that it's fine. But I see where all the reviews are coming from. I think some reviewers were too harsh on this game personally, but I can't pretend that there are no issues here. So I want this review to come off as constructive criticism from someone who has played many collectathon platformers in his near 30 years of being on this earth. And hopefully, this review can also offer advice to any others looking to make a game in this genre. So first things first, how does the game actually feel? Any platformer needs to have good gameplay feel to be enjoyable. That's what allows Super Mario 64 to stand the test of time. It just feels fun to play as Mario. And in Clive and Wrench, it does feel fun to play as the titular duo. There's a bit of slipperiness to their movement, but the only major complaint I have is that the glide goes on indefinitely and can't really be stopped. It feels like it should have more weight to it and a limit to it, but it just doesn't and it feels a bit awkward. But that's it for movement complaints. Well, actually, there is one more. Clive and Wrench never change. It's not a requirement for a 3D platformer to have ever-expanding movesets, but all the best ones do, whether they be permanent upgrades like in Banjo-Kazooie or one-off power-ups like in 3D Mario. Clive and Wrench have the same movement and attack options from start to finish, and this can get boring eventually. And it doesn't help that, even though the game feels fine to play, everything around the core gameplay has issues. First, you have hitboxes, and they suck. Clive and Wrench have a spin attack a la Crash Bandicoot, but its hitbox is super janky, and more often than not, you will get hurt alongside doing damage. This is an issue with common enemies, and when the more unique and dangerous enemies show up, it's even worse. This spear woman from the Egypt stage is just one example, and I'm pretty sure they always drop a health pickup on defeat because the game knows the player will get hurt fighting them. But what's worse than the regular enemies are the bosses. For the most part, these suck. The game tries to change up how the bosses work, which is nice. Some involve the player trying to dodge until they can attack back, while others involve fighting waves of enemies, and some are more focused on providing a platforming challenge as opposed to an actual fight. That latter one is easily the best of the bunch, but that's not saying a whole lot, especially when the final encounter is kind of lacklustre. A special shout out to the second boss, which is just the worst thing ever. The cutscene building up to it is long and boring, and the fight itself is far more frustrating than it should be, while somehow also being a really simple case of just waiting for your chance to attack. The boss design aside, as some of the issues there are very specific, and some of the bosses are decent, the main solution here would be making a more exaggerated hitbox and making the hurtbox smaller. That might trivialise some encounters, but like, the combat is hardly a focus anyway, it's more of a minor inconvenience that can't really be ignored, and the hitbox changes could be relayed with some over-the-top spinning animation. Using animation is key for relaying information to the player or creating an atmosphere, and this is also something that Clive and Wrench suffers from. The biggest example of this and easiest issue to fix, in my opinion, is the super jump. Holding down the R button will put Clive into a crouch, and then jumping out of it will make the player jump much higher than normal. It's great for travelling vertically and it's functionally fine, but it's absolutely charmless. The way it's presented feels like an early prototype for the move, because its animation is just non-existent. Clive will go into a crouch and then stay there, unmoving, until the player jumps or lets go of the button. You'd expect some kind of indicator of the move building up, or even just some small looping animation to show Clive preparing, but there's nothing. Given that this is an issue that's been solved in games since Super Mario Bros. 2 on the NES, which just used a simple flashing indicator over the characters to show the jump was ready to be made, it just makes the lack of anything here more baffling. And that's possibly the biggest offence in this game. It lacks charm in several areas. And that just adds to the game feeling unpolished. 
When I think back to the classics like Banjo and Kazooie or Ratchet and Clank, or even more modern examples like Ukulele and A Hat in Time, they ooze charm and it can make me forgive when the gameplay elements of those games lack. But Clive and Wrench doesn't fully commit to this. It clearly tries and wants to, but seemingly decided that what it had was enough when it really wasn't. Take this early example from the game's intro, which gave me similar vibes to the opening of Conker's Bad Fur Day, with its mix of a menacing atmosphere but goofy humour. One of the game's villains passes by a random match salesman, takes a match and lights it before throwing it behind him, setting all the other matches alight along with the match seller himself. Now, I can ignore the non sequitur nature of a match salesman just being here in the first place. These type of games tend to have random elements like this that exist just for humour, but what bothers me is the total lack of sound effects. As it is now, the joke really lacks a punch, when instead, if it had added the sound of the fire lighting or even just a Wilhelm screen when the matchstick owner realises he's on fire, the moment would have been much funnier. And this is, again, just one example. There's also the camera, which in gameplay is fine, at least no worse than most other 3D platformers. Sometimes though, it can get into a certain position that causes the game textures to not load in, and the cracks in the matrix begin to show. This is obviously really jarring in gameplay scenarios, but I'm not sure what advice I could offer to avoid this. Fixes I can advise on, however, apply to the camera in fixed cutscenes because they can also show the shortcomings of the game's visuals. Take this early scene once again from the game's intro. We get this long, panning shot of Clive's sister walking into the room with her coffee and pouring some cereal, but we can clearly see that there is nothing in the cereal box. The cereal manifests out of thin air, there's not even a low quality 2D texture in the cereal box to make it feel full. Now, you can solve this by adding cereal to the box, or simply changing the camera angle so that the player can't see inside the box. The camera seems to be fixed here because it's trying to hide the fact that the blueprints to the time machine have been stolen, and it wants this dramatic reveal to happen when Clive's sister finds out. Except that can't really be the case, because the first shot in this scene is showing the player that the blueprints have been stolen, so there is no excuse to not change the camera angle here and there are several more instances where the game's lack of polish could be at least hidden by better placed cameras. This isn't all to say the game lacks charm entirely. You have all these parody games and brands in the first level which get a good laugh and there is clearly some attention to detail put into little things. It just feels misplaced sometimes. Making all the textures for the parody games is a much simpler process than adding some new animations in but the time spent on the latter would have better served the game in my opinion. This critique also goes towards the general quality of the game's models and the dialogue sections. This game can't seem to decide if it wants to use no words to convey its story, mumble dialogue a la Banjo or Kazooie, or just text. It uses all three throughout the game and it would have been better served to just have one, in my personal opinion, the mumble dialogue. It would have also allowed Clive and Wrench themselves to get some actual character in because, as they stand, they're both very dull and generic. There isn't a lot memorable about any of the characters really, it says a lot when the best character in the game is the guest appearance from Ukulele's Trouser the Snake. The worst character is easily this alpaca. This design is a bit boring, but what really bothers me about him is just how useless he is. In almost every level you can find a scroll, and giving it to the alpaca causes him to reveal a secret. Some piece of advice that will help the player find one of the game's many collectibles. But these secrets are always hot garbage. It's either an issue that you've largely solved already by the time you even find the scroll, or something so obvious the player was bound to stumble across it at some point. Instead of telling me how to get to the palace roof, the eventual end point of this stage, give me a hint on how to solve this cryptic floor puzzle inside the palace so I don't just have to trial and error guess my way through it instead. This scroll is an ultimately pointless collectible, and this game already has too many collectibles. Every stage has 10 MacGuffins to get. One of the MacGuffins is achieved by finding 5 keys, and another by finding 5 level sensitive collectibles, like badger children or freeing slaves. Then there is a random number of stopwatches in each level. 
I have no idea why it is random per level and the way these stopwatches are handled also sucks. They come in different colours with different values, kind of like the rupees in The Legend of Zelda. But I have to ask, why? It just makes the game confusing and serves to artificially inflate the total number. If I'm missing 5 stopwatches in a level, I have no clue if it's a group of 5 bundled together, 5 separated across the map, or just a single stopwatch that's worth 5 somewhere in the level. At least the game offers a radar to help track down any stopwatches the player might have missed. This is a great feature and I wish there was something similar for the MacGuffins, as the humorous but often vague descriptors for these collectibles found in the pause screen just aren't enough. And with the scale of these levels often being way too big than they realistically should be, it makes finding that one missing collectible a big time waster. Then lastly, there are just some sloppy or awkward graphical issues. The game looks like a PS2 game in HD and I'm not actively against this. It's an indie game ultimately, made by a small team, with most of it being the vision of one person. I'm not going to expect AAA graphics, and what's here is passable. But as someone who does know how to 3D model for games and animation, I can't help but see where the weight painting has failed on the rigging of the characters, or where the hard edges on the mesh have caused the textures to look weird, or where certain texture effects just haven't worked as intended. When I first saw this table in the first level, I thought I was looking through the model. But it turned out to be glass, where the reflective elements were only added to one side. It's little things like this that bring down the game as a whole. Even after all this critique, I don't think the game is bad. We don't give game scores on this channel, but if we did it would probably be like a 6 out of 10, because the game is perfectly serviceable for those who enjoy 3D collectathon platformers and want more of them. It even has enough content here to match those mainline collectathon games as well, but that is also where I think the root of all these issues lie. In an attempt to be as big and as impressive as AAA 3D platformers, the game has added in a lot of content. But due to having a much, much smaller team in place, this content has taken the development time away from actually polishing the game. I would reckon that if the last four levels of the game were cut entirely, and the time making them was spent on polishing and refining what was already there, then the game would have been much better off for it. I have no proof of this of course, it's just a feeling, but that's ultimately all a review can be. My feelings. While I think critics have been a bit too harsh on this game, it's not entirely unjustified and that's a real shame. There is something to enjoy here, I just wish it felt like a finished product full of charm and without any of the frustration. I hope this review didn't come off as too harsh or too negative, like I really did want to give constructive feedback for this one, because I can see the potential there. If you have played this game, let me know in the comments your thoughts, and if you haven't played this game, let me know what you thought of the video, if it was something that you were considering picking up or not. Uh, I want to thank all of our patrons who will be on screen right now, the $5 up tier. You can find out how you can join them by checking out the description below. I hope you leave a like, and also if you have any advice on what you like about 3D Collectathon platformers and how much you think the charm should be a part of it, let me know in the comments. I'm always keen to hear others' opinions on topics like this. Alright, I hope you all have a great day, and always remember to return to the source.